Okay. All right. Welcome in, everyone. Thank you for coming to the final session of the day. Uh, this is the Confidential Computing Consortium. And today, we are going to be talking about privacy in the age of compute. So if you are familiar with Confidential Computing Consortium, or if you have not been, we had a couple of extremely useful sessions here at KubeCon this week that will be available for uh, post-recorded viewing. I strongly encourage you, if you've got an interest in this and actually want to start working with us on your own systems, go check out the hands-on workshop. That recording should be available, and you can reach out to those engineers as well for more questions. We did have at the booth a confidential compute use case mini session. If you missed that, don't worry, because I stole many of those slides and I put them in this presentation. We will also be getting a recording of those from Axel from Red Hat. Uh, there was also an incredibly good talk from NVIDIA, from silicone to service, looking at really interesting ways of doing confidential computing with GPUs. Definitely be on the lookout for those recordings. We will be writing about them when they are available. So in this talk today, we're going to talk about four things. Um, one, what is the highest order threat that we are preventing with confidential computing? Number two, how does the use of secure primitives enable confidential computing? What are the interesting confidential compute cases right now? And how can we use this when we're considering privacy in the age of big compute? So in my background, I do have a slightly different way of thinking about security and systems. I'm used to building in high dimensional systems, but before that, I was used to building systems looking at people engaging in high dimensional systems. So we were building systems to look at how people think between each other when they are flying cockpits in high failure conditions. That looks a lot like the kind of engineers and the kind of psychology that you will experience from developers on SRE and cybersecurity triage teams. My second paper was on direct modulation of uh, human brains, uh, working on figuring out how we could make machines faster while engaging directly with conscious and unconscious attention. Then I went on to go work on a US government portfolio with ATA. So this was first at the Missile Defense Agency and at the US Kessel Run. I did leave Kessel Run after seven months, but that's only because I got married and moved to the UK. And for a skiff, they uh, would not let me continue working remotely from 3,000 miles away. I then, in the UK, started working on a couple of OS projects, so reliability and chaos uh, toolkit. So I was really interested in figuring out best ways to work on multi-platform uptime and making that available and free. Then I went and I worked with Sonatype, and I worked on supply chain, and then I tried to go back to working on supercomputers, but I was worried about our ability to do big compute with sensitive data, and that's why I came here. There's three books that are incredibly important, I think, to understand the current moment of security that we are in beyond open source exclusively. Uh, this sits well within it. So the one that's been most influential to me has been Cyber Deception. This is the one from 2021. This is usually the book that you're going to use if you want to read up on the like, highest current standard of creating honeypots or surveillance when people are trying to break into your systems. But chapter 11, the final chapter of 2021, was uh, just an absolute quagmire. It was the first time where they said, we're seeing a major issue that these massive honeypot systems are now being infiltrated. They know the honeypot's there, or they're testing the honeypot's there, and it's just bot on bot action. And the real thing that is actually being exploited is the compute that it takes, right, to sustain these. It's hard to do surveillance when the counter surveillance also looks like human that you don't know which it is ever going to be. Then you have to move to Mike Bursell's book on trust and start asking your question, what is the trust boundary if I no longer do know if it's going to be a human or a person on the other side? And you have to think differently about it. I'm going to leave generative AI security here because it's very important in some of the bigger systems that we want to, when we think about the total compliance we're building. I'm not going to lean too much on it here, but everyone should read this book. So for a long time, I'm thinking about how we build for security systems with a human in the loop intentionally, knowing that humans are in the loop both maliciously, 
They're in there benign. They're in there sometimes just making mistakes. I want to design systems against that too. And I'm also interested in designing systems where we prevent human or machine or work light identity that we don't want into the loop. Now I'm gonna tell you what I believe is the largest threat that we are able to protect from. I'm, not, I'm gonna speak to specific use cases later, but it's gonna help you to understand why there's a composite of use cases that have come forward first and specifically in regulatory areas. So privacy interacts with security in an extremely unique way because privacy that includes personally identifiable information requires the highest standard of security in most or every compliance mechanism or regulatory framework we have on Earth. So the meaning of data has changed because big compute makes it much easier to re-identify individuals. We have to change our mindset. Let me explain to you exactly what this means. So this is the concept, mathematically, of unicity. So it's the ability to find the right data sets to be able to re-identify an individual or a group of individuals in a sparse vector data set. This, in the English language, generally is used as embodied kindness and openness. But in unicity, it means that I am able to know uh, if I'm able to find a specific object or the traits of a given class of objects before I go looking. Um, a great way to understand this, if you've done cryptography, which you may have if you are listening to this talk, is unicity distance. That's not specifically what we're referring to, but it's so close that it's a good metaphor to lean on. Um, so unicity distance is letting you calculate exactly how big this haystack has to be in order for you to find a specific hash needle. And this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, because we have been transmitting data openly, and because we have principles that I think are incredibly appropriate, like open science and open data, we're running into some really unique conditions. This is a paper that I ran into. Um, it comes from the National Institutes of Cancer Research from NIH. Um, and they were playing with, uh, we were running into issues of being able to release data sets because of unicity concerns because of data that had been breached just in the DC area. Now this is not a condition where we're needing to protect patients, you're mostly needing to protect the uh, controls who are likely to live in the area and to be breached and able to be found by their street addresses. So you were able to find that just by using this Netflix breach data set that uh, conve uh, Unicity is convex and it's like pretty linear so you know if you have the right data sets overlapping, you just have to get enough of it. Um, and if you see these numbers, they should be incredibly concerning. Taken together, our results show that the privacy of individuals is very unlikely to be preserved even in country scale location data sets. So things like data diffusion, all of our normal privacy diffusion mechanisms may not be sufficient for sparse data sets. So here's what we know now. The attention of malicious interest onto data sets that are considered benign in isolation are more likely to be harvested because of the data, uh, because the data now represents a rich interaction with sparked, sparse vector, vector databases. It's now more important than ever to keep that data in isolation. So we know there are regulated environments where we have known sensitive data and we are doing this work there already. There are more and growing conditions where this unicity concern makes that important. So although anonymous data are not considered personal data at this time, they can certainly be used to identify an individual or a group of individual. And we have to be able to protect this in three conditions. We're pretty good at two of them, and we are now getting very good at the third. So number one, data in transit, transversing over the network. Data in rest, data in storage. And data in use, data that's being processed. I'll explain to you how we go about protecting that. Now here's what else we know. On the technical context, this is a uh, old concept and new concept at the same time. So the idea behind this came in 1978 uh, from a paper on uh, privacy preserving computation. Uh, for reference, that is the year that the uh, Bee Gees Night Fever was the top song, and I was listening to it while I was writing the slide. It's, it holds up, it's great. 
Um, then 2009, we finally got uh, from Craig Gentry a fully homomorphic encryption, which unlocked a lot of uh, networking and architectural opportunities. 2015, we're getting one of our first uh, uh, TEEs. 2018, we have the CCC established. 2020s, we get more edge products and cloud products brought into the CC space. And we have not just the H100, but several GPUs uh, coming today. Now, if that timeline seems like a cool timeline to you, it is absolutely, but I think it's worth remembering that the privacy paper was written in 1978, and we got our first ARM chip delivered seven years later. These are ideas that are not new, and that's why the regulation around them is more mature than our technology. So the threat model that we are dealing with in confidential computing is very big. Both regulated and non-regulated industries address a shared rising threat in the interaction of benign or diffuse data. How does the use of secure primitives enable confidential computing? So secure primitives are foundational building blocks of cryptographic and security protocols. These are some of the most well-known examples. And they are designed to be isolated, and they can be updated modularly. Uh, and for an example of how these things interact with a little bit more detail, I reached out to uh, Hart Montgomery from the post-quantum uh, area of the Linux Foundation, and they came to our attack to talk to us what exactly it is that they're doing and how exactly that will interact with us. Because as we need to switch out different primitives, we need to be aware of that interoperability. There's four security primitives that are involved in confidential computing. These are generally involved as the silicone primitives uh, of confidentiality, the ability to protect sensitive data from unauthorized access, even during processing, using hardware enforced encryption. Integrity, making sure that code has not been altered or tampered. Attestation, verifying the trustworthiness of the computing environment. And a hardware root of trust. This is the foundational and immutable hardware component. We're trying to make sure here that we are making zero assumptions when we execute. I put a little asterisk by the attestation because if you are at KubeCon, there's a very good chance that you might be a Kubernetes engineer. And there's a very good chance that you have heard the language of attestation mostly around the supply chain, which is not wrong. It's just that there are more than one technical definitions that we're using, and ours is remote attestation. So yes, if you want to build an SBOM, you need to. We need to do these well. We need to do these hygienically. I need supply chain to do this extremely well, because we still need it for our stuff. Here's what I mean if I'm talking about remote attestation. And I think this is why we needed to ha take the time to have the clarity to understand why this is hardware-driven. It's hardware-driven architecture. So if I am doing remote attestation, it's a security mechanism that is used to verify the trustworthiness of a remote system's runtime state. It ensures that the system is operating securely and meets a predefined security requirement before it goes on to process that data or workload. So the key focus of remote attestation, and this comes from RATS architecture, is runtime verification. Ensure that all the current run state of the, the current state of the system, not just run state, the hardware, firmware, and software aligns with the security baselines. Evidence-based trust. We use cryptographic evidence. Dynamic security. We provide a real-time or near real-time validation of the security posture. This is variable depending on your security architecture. And secure communication. We ensure the evidence is exchanged that is authentic, untampered, and transmitted securely. It's very challenging to understand our architecture from just that description, but I have better ways for you to understand it. So as long as we keep those four primitives in mind, we can start to think about the ways in which our, our OS uh, projects engage. So we've got Keystone, which is using a TPM-based primitive to continuously verify runtime integrity on Linux-based systems, for example. So you've probably, hopefully, gone to the workshop on confidential virtual machines this week. 
Uh, to break that down a little bit more, we have confidential computing, which is generally about protecting sensitive application and code and data within trusted execution environments. And confidential computing with CVMs gives the emphasis on secure, isolated virtual machines that run applications in protected environments. This lets us leverage the hypervisor and hardware capabilities together. And confidential containers within this extend confidential computing principles to containerized applications, providing an added layer of security. And uh, if you liked the last two slides, it's because I asked Islal to tell me everything they knew about secure primitives, and we recorded that talk. Um, that's worth uh, watching. If you're a visual thinker, I'll give this to you one last time. And these slides are from Mike Bursell, and I think they're great. Thank you. <laughs> so there's type 1, type 2, and type 3 isolation. Um, this really gets you out of the mindset of thinking application layer and all the way down. So type 1 isolation is uh, workload from workload isolation. This is multi-tenant isolation. Type 2, host from workload isolation. Virtual machines and containers are very good at this. Then there is type 3, which is workload Isola uh, workload from host isolation. We're talking the cloud provider at this point. Um, and virtual machines and containers, by their very nature, cannot do this. Hardware-based trusted execution environments can do this. There is the added benefit that they give you type 1 and type 2 security implicitly. Now I hope after 24 slides, we now have a very clear understanding of what the protection of data in use by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment means. So now we understand that secure primitives and secure by design principles help us to assure that we are protecting data in all three states of data, in transit, in rest, and in use using confidential computing. So with that in mind, what are the most compelling use cases right now? So here is a, a very, very good way to look at the different use cases and categorizations. Uh, this is from Axel from Red Hat, who gave this use case mini session. They're going to give another recording for that of this online. This, I think, explains these six really interesting ways. So there's partner interaction. That's interesting and straightforward. Secure Cloudburst. This becomes really, really interesting, especially in the context of having access to GPU Cloudbursts. Um, IP protection and integrity. I think that's pretty well understood by the nature of this technology. Um, taking this to edge devices. Total tenant isolation with OpenShift, right? Having this very easy to lift and shift using OpenShift, and digital sovereignty, um, of which the cases, I think, are very interesting, and we'll talk about one today. Here's another great slide, um, and it's from the same talk. And if you look at the bottom, this is another way of looking at how you might make your architectural decisions around confidential computing based on what is important to you, based on bare metal versus public cloud preference. Right? So this goes to show you a extremely bare metal to extremely public cloud solution. Um, and we'll talk about why CC, digital sovereignty, and public cloud are necessarily all entwined. Before we do that, I'm going to start with my favorite use case, definitely. Um, it's uh, confidential computing for human rights. And we are seeing more cases for this. And I have many discussions uh, with the nonprofits and teams that are right at the edge of implementing this if they can guarantee the value in it. And this is a use case that shows this so clearly. So in highly regulated environments, of which criminal activity is one, so if you're trying to go and find criminal data sets using OSINT, you were traditionally not able to ever hold on to human trafficking data sets. You couldn't save them onto your own server. That was illegal. You don't want to have a secondary proxy of criminal data that could then be revectorized, given sparse data set concerns. Right? So 
for the first time, that was very good regulation in its idea, but it made it very hard for us to actually stop massive criminal activity online. Now, we are working with a consortium of different uh, human trafficking uh, services who are able to hold and store their data locally. And there is the ability to do federated learning between every single one of these anti-human trafficking services such that they are able to query in with specific questions about the data at other agencies, aggregate it, bring it together, and no human eyes have ever or will ever look at this sensitive data again as we turn these into databases that we can take near real-time action over. How cool is that? Here's the example of that, and if you wanna go to the talk for this, I've got a QR at the end as well that you can capture these slides. Um, this is a great way to go and look at why they implemented this, what their regulation was, and uh, why it might be interesting to you. Here's another very good example that's strongly driven by regulation. So uh, there's a really great example, and again, a recording where you can go and look at details of this, of moving Microsoft's 25 billion per year credit card processing system to Azure, done fully over confidential computing. This was important because they had to do this in a way that it was fully observable and that it could be fully replicated by the regulatory environment. So there's absolutely nothing that is non-standard about their implementation and that's absolutely worth investigating. Uh, and there's lots written about it because of that. And uh, very specifically, if you are interested in uh, regulation around banks because you either work in one or because you are a customer of one, it's worth understanding that there's the PCI DSS, uh, which is a standard that is implemented across almost all um, credit agencies at this time or banking agencies at this time. And we used, wait, this is so cool. So here's the final note about this, because the PCI DSS thing is interesting, because it basically means this is a proof case, and there's this massive regulation, it has to be confidential, getting this right means that this is genuinely probably the underpending of that financial system. Uh, there's also so many medical use cases for this that it's challenging for me to choose the best ones. I didn't link to this talk specifically, but it is available uh, if you search these words. Um, but I thought this was a really great example because they had a like larger uh, compute surface area. So this talk is a really nice example if you're uh, an academic institution, a research institution-sized organization. How would you go about um, shifting to a cloud confidential Kubernetes? If that's your question, this is the use case that's going to be most like what you're looking for. And then data sovereignty. I find this very interesting um, because it's, it's extremely straightforward. The regulation makes uh, security over runtime data usage, I think, absolutely necessary. Um, and even right now without making those words necessarily codified. So when you're looking at sovereign regulation in technology, typically there's three pillars of it. It's gonna be data sovereignty, it's gonna be operational sovereignty, and it's gonna be technological sovereignty. And these are requirements. So this, uh, the talk link down here is great because it's a federated learning uh, architecture between Switzerland, France, and Italy. So you definitely want to look at this real use case of sovereign cloud. Um, and so I think there's two notes in this. There's data sovereignty, I think we pretty much understand that. Operational sovereignty is actually codified so we can understand that it's absolutely necessary to have these things attested. And then technical sovereignty is not something that is covered under CC. And then confidential compute for AI, I'm gonna skip over this because one, this slide is a little bit older. Number two, um, there's some really cool stuff that you should be looking into if you do actually wanna look into the way that this is being built out in real time on the technology level. So I just, this slide is probably better to focus on if you wanna get interested in where things are moving quick. But I also think that you should go and look at this recording if you wanna know the absolute up to date because this happened yesterday and I guarantee you includes the absolute cutting edge. So with that, 
I think my goal here was really to describe uh, the use of secure per primitives, the threat model, the largest threat model, because when you are setting up your architecture and you're setting up your compliance and governance patterns initially, this is really a lot of startups right now, you have to ask yourself, what is the likelihood of breach at the front, right? And I think if people were considering unicity concerns, they might be considering confidential computing a lot sooner because I know that I'm seeing research institutions move towards this immediately, whether or not their data is sensitive because they have been doing statistics around correlations and finding this for years. We've got some incredible use cases, and if any of these inspired you, there's quite a few more in these sectors, just talk to me. And uh, this is us initially considering privacy in the age of compute. There's a lot of regulation and compliance to come up. I just gave a talk two weeks ago or three weeks ago in Georgia where I went over every single uh, CC open source project. Um, I separated them by cloud, uh, mobile IoT, and distributed systems. Um, go and watch that. I will say there is a typo uh, in one of them in which there is an ARM AMD mix up, but I do reference the correct chip, so I think we're fine. Um, because I'm not going to that talk today, I want to cover just two slides because it's one of the ways that I go in and I do an initial analysis of um, open source projects. I like to go and do time sampled semantic analyses um, up to the, a, a given release, letting me know what words were most indicative of the release's success. It's a very cool way to look at how developers think. But this is very, very simply just looking at across 2024 so far. Um, the top 25 uh, words and their correlation likelihoods across all of our readmes for our open source projects. So this is indicative of what is the most longstanding and has the most semantic weight and impact on this development space and thought. Now, if we take that out to 50, I think it gets really, really interesting really fast, especially if you've been developing in the space for a while, because it is moving really quick into expanding into a very application space looking area quick. There's something like Jupyter Notebooks on here, which may be surprising if you have not checked in on confidential computing in two or three years. So right now, we have three open calls out for CCC mentorship programs if you want to get involved. So there's an ILIT mentorship. This is an awesome opportunity. So we are uh, trying to strengthen security through FUDS testing. Um, you, the skills that you need for this really are a like, reasonable understanding of Rust. Um, but a lot of this is getting an understanding of confidential computing, virtualization, and ARM architecture. So if this seems like something that would be interesting to you, definitely reach out to me. Then there's two opportunities through Verizon. There's enhancing co-room support. So this one might be a little bit trickier, but I know there's engineers out there that are interested in this. And this is a formal Linux Foundation mentorship. So this is a paid opportunity, particularly if you have a master's student or a PhD student in mind. That might be great for this. Please reach out to me on their behalf, because security PhD students will not send me an email, but you might, and I need them. So. Uh, the skills that we need for that is knowledge of RATS architecture, and again, you would be sitting inside of the CCC and you would have all of the support from all of the engineers that are actually building this out. It's your opportunity to learn this as an expert. Um, API integration and Go is the language that you need. Most of us are familiar with Go. If we are engineering Kubernetes, this should be easy. And then uh, harmonizing open source verifiers with RATS standards. Again, this is generally a good knowledge of RATS architecture and policy management. So if this is an area that you're really interested in, um, this is a cool opportunity. Uh, I am, I'm really interested. So you really only have two months if you are seeing this in post recording, because I am also giving these out again at FOSDEM, and I guarantee you I'm going to have to fight off a few security engineers then. But uh, for now, I'm going to leave this right there because there is quite a lot um, going on in regulation right now. 
that I really want to cover in depth. And if you found that interesting, I'm going to be working with my engineers to get a couple of those out in depth really related to the applications that they are building out as well, right? So not just where regulation is important, but where specific aspects of CCC have been building out things that are compliant to those compliance mechanisms. If you found this interesting, then Confidential Computing Consortium is a sub-foundation of Linux Foundation, just like CNCF. So we do have special interest groups, and anyone is welcome to join in them. Two that you might find interesting, if you were interested in either the regulation or technical side of this talk, um, for confidential computing developers or security engineers that are interested in learning more about attestation, I strongly encourage you to check out our attestation SIG. We also have a kernel SIG. But I really encourage you to go in and look at those recordings. It's really invaluable to see the conversations that are being had between those engineers and the questions that are being asked when we are trying to do our highest standard of proof around attestation. Um, and then privacy engineers with regulated compute or lawyers sitting around regulated compute. We have a lot of really interesting things going on in our governance, regulation, and compliance SIG, particularly driven by banking regulation. Uh, and we have both US and European interests that are showing up to the table. And we know that we need to have a very different strategy and communication between both of those. And that is most of the reason why I wrote this talk, because that, I think, is something that we really, really need to work on, better communication to regulators, because this is important. With that, I'll open to any questions that you have. But thank you so much for your time.